Precious Father, we thank you that your word will never fail us. We thank you that when your word is in our hearts, we will not be shaken nor broken, Lord God. That you are establishing us, you are transforming us, you are helping us to become all that you created us to be. Lord Jesus Christ, we lift you up, we exalt you, we magnify you. Holy Spirit, you are celebrated in this house as you only witness and speak about Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, who is God, who leads us and guides us into all the divine plans and purposes that was already predestined for us. Before we were even formed in our mother's womb, you already had a plan for each and every one of us. And we thank you, Lord God, that you did not give up on us. You continue to pursue us. You continue to draw us. Thank you for the men and the women that came and witnessed to us. Thank you, Lord God, that you spoke through them and drawing us to you through them. We thank you, Father God, that today, as we go going into the word, that the word that will not be shaken, the word that will not fail, be so deeply etched in our hearts that for all eternity, that we are becoming the word made flesh. And we thank you, Father God, that as we go through your word today, I pray for revelation. I pray for wisdom. I pray for knowledge and above all understanding. I thank you, Father God, for all that you shall accomplish through your word in Jesus' mighty name. And all those agreed said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. You may be seated in heavenly places. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Yeah, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And um, we could have been anywhere uh, else, but we are here in the house of God. Amen. Hallelujah. And then the Lord began to speak a word and said, Light be, and then light was. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. See, the word is powerful. It never fail you. You see. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I, I'm going to continue with the series that I started a couple of uh, weeks ago about the sacred things of God. And I pushed on you and I, we are sacred to God. You need to understand that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are sacred to God. We are special to God. And then we went through the Old Testament speaking about, do we keep the Sabbath? Are we allowed to eat pork? Are we allowed to eat prawns? And many people get freaked out because it's like, oh, we can't do this. We can't do that. Uh, we're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And then we saw how Jesus even said on the Sabbath, my father and I are still working. So we're going to look in scripture today and we're going to see that Jesus would not lead you astray. We're going to see that Apostle Paul would not lead you astray. Because when you look at Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Meaning he was more Jewish than any other Jew you could think of. He was more educated than any other Pharisee, Sadducee, because he was so zealous for the things of God that God began to reveal himself to him because his name was Saul. And then God hit him off of his high horse and he became Paul. So sometimes we need to get off of the high horse of our pride, our education, our skills, and come to a place of being lowly and humble. And God can then begin to speak. And we see Jesus speaks to Saul, who becomes Paul, and he's, he says, why do you persecute me? And then he responds, uh, Lord, who am I persecuting? Where did I persecute you? And the word continues, and he says, my church. See, Jesus says, we are him and he is us. So whatever happens against the church happens directly to Jesus. That's why he defends the church. And we're going to be going on a series about sacred things, about where the church actually stands in all scripture. So I'm going to take you on a journey where we're going to see the church was hidden in scripture before the time began. That the church was God's original plan. And we, the church, God is elevating us to show us all of his wisdom so that principalities and powers can realize that the body of Christ called the church is separate. And through our walk and our lifestyle with Jesus Christ, the Jews will return and eventually receive Jesus Christ as their God. Amen. So we're going to go through these things quickly. I'm just going to do a, a quick uh, summary. And um, we touched on... You know, the law versus grace. Some people say we too much on the law or we too much grace. And some people push it too far and they become so full of grace, but there's no power to change. And they're living a sinful, carnal life. 
because there's freedom that we as Christians have received that the Jews could not handle. The early church, and I please, I'm not fighting against Jews. I love the Jews because salvation came through the Jews. But the reality is they missed it, but we got it. Amen? Okay, some of you did not get it now, but you'll get it later because we got what they did not get. Okay, I'm not going to try and say that too fast because then I'm going to get myself tongue-tied and we got what they didn't get and they didn't get what we got. And then you go like this and then, yeah, I just made that up right now. And then you're like confused. So law versus grace. Oh, what are we? Do we follow the law? Do we have to keep the Sabbath? Do we have to keep uh, Pentecost? Do we have to keep the feasts? We teach about the feasts in this church so you can understand what the feasts really mean. And we're going to see through Scripture what is the Sabbath? I taught on Sabbath. Sabbath is when one day you and I will breathe our last and we will enter into our Sabbath because we did the work of the Lord on the earth. Amen. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. I'm just, I can see you need to idle a little bit, get the engine warmed up. And then, like I said, Jesus even said on the Sabbath, my father and I are working on the Sabbath. And I'm going to show you a scripture in the Old Testament that even Jesus tells them to do certain things. Would Jesus lead you into sin? Would Jesus cause you to break certain things so that you can be displeasing? Okay, as long as you've got that in your mind, you're okay. Because today there are so many people that become so legalistic. They're trying to keep everything. Be, but you need to understand if you break one of the 316 laws, you've broken them all. Okay? When I speak to Jewish people or people that are Christian going back to the old ways, I ask them, when do you pray for your meal? I pray before I eat. You broke the law because you're supposed to pray after you eat. So you've broken 316 laws by praying at the wrong time. Sorry, brother, you've been uh, cut off from God. You understand? You break one, you break them all. But the good news, let me not get there too quickly because I'm going to show you. All we need to do is read the Bible and the Bible explains itself. See, God made it uh, silly proof. The Bible is silly proof. I'm silly, so I uh, can prove that I'm silly, but yet the word makes sense. Hallelujah. Okay, I don't know what's happening. It must be winter. So, so, we, <laughs> so we're going to go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 to 17. And before I read that, we're going to see from um, Genesis chapter 1 through to Genesis chapter 11. In Genesis chapter 6, we see a flood came for judgment because mankind was wicked in all of their ways and God removed the Holy Spirit off of the earth. And then we see there was a man called Noah and God taught Noah that was before the law what animals were clean and what animals were unclean. So all the clean animals, he had seven of each, not two by two. The clean animals were set apart for sacrifices to God. There were only certain animals that God would accept when we brought a sin offering or a thank offering, a grain offering. So there were certain animals that were considered clean. And up until this point, the, the, the diet of those who worship God were vegetarians because God then spoke to Noah. So praise God for Noah that we now get to eat meat. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. Because prior to that, they did not eat meat. Because in the garden it says you eat from all the trees. Okay? But then in Noah's time, God said, now you may eat. Thank God for meat. To eat. Hallelujah. So we see this where the Lord showed him. Now, would that mean that God broke his law when he said to Adam and Eve, you shall only eat of the fruit and that? No. There were certain things that were put in place. Because if you look at it, we would end up... How many times have you seen when certain people go to certain nations and they colonize an area and certain animals go extinct? Because remember, we had the dodo bird, a really big chicken that was too stupid to run away and you could eat it. And that's why they went extinct. Good meat. Amen. Sad thing, no brain. Okay. So, yeah, but we've noticed through history, man has overeaten and man has taken advantage and taken it to an extreme. So that's why the Lord began to establish this at a later stage when he used Noah. So we're going to Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. And it says, in him you were all circumcised. So now we're going to go to the mountain today and we're going to have circumcision. Where's all the men? Say amen. No, we're not going. It's too cold. I'm not doing that. But uh, 
you don't need to go and have circumcision. Okay? That's uh, all right. But it says here, in him you were all circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I do not want to lose anything or 25% off. This is not a special. That's how it is. Amen? That's what I'm just saying. So, here we see that it's not of hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So the Jews think by because they circumcised their right with the Lord. They think because Abraham is their descendant uh, or their ancestor, they think it's okay with him. And it's not. It's faith in God. That's what makes you right with the Lord. Okay? And we see that Jesus, through him, we are circumcised in the heart. Verse 12 says, Buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So when we do water baptism, that is your burial. That's actually what happens. The old you dies. You leave him in the water. Cheers, old man, and you're in the new man. Because that's actually what it means. Now, don't call your father old man, okay? Because we had Father's Day. Don't take it out on the old man. But it's speaking about your old ways, the carnal ways. Stays behind. And then you step out as the new. So verse 13 says, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So even though we are not circumcised in the flesh, we are circumcised in the heart, and therefore we put off the body of sin and carnality. Okay? Verse 19 says, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. So the law was, uh, now we're not abolishing the law. Please understand this. Okay? You see the law is true, the law is spiritual, the law is good. But the reality is here that because of the law, there were consequences. And if you broke the law, you were separated from God. But Jesus came to fulfill the law. And you and I, we fulfill the law. Let me not jump ahead because we see it in Scripture. I just want to read this to you. This does not mean now, okay, we're done with the law. Um, and, and now we don't need to follow anything. We can live however we want. No, it's not that. Because there's something that we have that the Jews never had. They did not have the Holy Spirit in them. Holy Spirit only came upon certain people that were elect, which was the high priest, it was the king, it was the prophet, it was the judge. And every time you see those men or women who passed away, the people went astray. Yeah, it even rhymes, how's that, eh? But when they passed away, the people went astray. Hallelujah, write that down. <laughs> okay, so we see that there's certain requirements which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way. So now you're on the way because he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So he fulfilled it because, you see, if you don't obey the full law, you are cursed. Okay? Because of the law. All right? So that curse went onto the cross. And that was Jesus. He became our curse. He became our punishment. He became our sin, our sickness, our poverty. He took that upon himself. Okay? Upon himself. That's when we need to praise him because what he did was to set us free. And unfortunately, the Jews are missing out. Okay? That's what we need to pray for them, that their eyes will be opened, the scales be removed off of their eyes so they can see the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Because it's their God who revealed himself to them that we now are saved and delivered. Verse 15 says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, all the fallen, perverted principalities and powers were put to shame. They were disarmed. A simple example, you can go do the study for yourself. Go read 1 Samuel chapter 5, and you'll see when they stole the Ark of the Covenant, they stuck the, the Ark in Dagon's uh, temple, and no man was there, and God taught that statue who's God. And they found the statue on its face, and then they put the statue up because it must have been a strong wind. Then the next day they came, and then we see Dagon had no arms and no feet. Okay? He was broken. He was, first time he was ba basically, look at it like this. A fallen god, a false god was bowing down to God. That's actually the first time. Okay? Go read it for yourself. 
I'm just giving it gratis for free. That's it. Verse 16 says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink. Woohoo! Okay, but it does not mean now you abuse it. Now you can eat whatever you want, but you can't abuse it. See, when we eat in excess and when we drink in excess, it's not good for you. My wife and I, we went to America. You know, America, they say it's the most obese nation. And when you go to every fast food place, all the drinks are bottomless, my man. <laughs> and you drink and it's only sugar drinks. Sugar, 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 sugar. Where does that sugar go if you don't let it go? <laughs> And that's why America is known as the most obese nation, because there's just so much excess. Even when we went to the restaurant, I can eat, but I could not finish what they put on my plate. So you can tell me the portions are big. You know, that's my wife. Yeah. You can eat on that twice, because the portions are massive. Everything's big in America. <laughs> okay? So let's continue. Um, verse 16. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or, and did you notice, plural, okay? I've taught from this pulpit, any day can be a Sabbath. Any day you need a day of rest. Speak to your doctor. Your doctor says, are you resting? Medical science says at least rest one day a week so that you can function correctly. So I think God has got some wisdom here. We don't just keep the Sabbath so we are right with God. We right with God because of Jesus. That's why we write. Not because we're doing certain things. Is that what your Bible says? I don't want to say anything of this pulpit and you say, no, but pastor, look what it's, what does it say? It's in writing. It settles it. Okay. Verse 17 says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. He is the Sabbath. He is the feast of Passover, Pentecost, Rosh Hashanah. He is all of that. Hanukkah, he is that. He's all of that. Okay? Let me, if you're not, you're not sure, let, let, let's deal with this. Because, yeah, when I go to a restaurant and then I order prawns, am I allowed to eat prawns? Okay? Do, it, do you guys eat prawns? Has anybody got a problem with prawns? Yeah? If you've got an allergy, sorry for you. But you're missing out, okay? But I just want to make sure I'm in the right crowd here because, I don't know, maybe you legalistic is like, oh, he eats prawns, my friend. Okay, let me not go there. Okay, 1 to me, chapter 4, verse 3 to 5. Verse 3 says, when you read this whole thing, he's to, yeah, Apostle Paul's talking to Timothy. Some people take everything to the extreme. And he says, they, they will come in extreme where they're forbidding to marry and command to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know that. Okay. Now, the reason why you can't eat pork in the biblical times is because they did not have proper refrigeration. So if you eat pork, okay, I know pork is a wonderful meat, especially breakfast. Eggs and bacon. And extra bacon. But if it's not taken care of, it's, it, it's, it can be very detrimental to your health. Okay? So what we do is, if you do have a craving for a steers burger with a slice of bacon, you are not going to go to hell because you had bacon. Okay? Because look here, he says... I haven't, I'm just saying this quickly. Let me read that again. God created to be received with thanksgiving. You see, I'm already giving thanksgiving for meat and for these things. Thank you, Lord, for Noah. Hallelujah. Because it says you receive it with thanksgiving. Okay? That's the first part. But look here. It goes a little bit further. Okay? By those who believe. So I believe that everything God created is good. Who said it? Good. Let me hear. Wait. Where did I hear? Good. Good. So there's it, from the man in the crowd. It was good. Therefore, it's good enough to, but look here, wait. Believe and know the truth. Let's go to verse 4. I heard that. Mm, yes, let's go. The truth, the whole truth. Well, set you free, my brother. Hallelujah. Verse 4 says, for every creature of God is good. Just what he said. So it's confirming. And nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Okay. Look at it like this. I'm going to share something with you. Jesus told the disciples that you must go into all the world. Now, when you go into all the world, have you seen every nation has got amazing dishes? Amen? 
So if you are called to another nation, make sure it's a good cuisine. Okay, Chinese, they eat all these other funny things. If there's any Chinese people here, please, I love you lots. But you eat things that should not be eaten, but you eat it. I'm grateful for uh, chicken chow mein. I'm, I'm happy for pork and, uh, you know, sweet and sour pork. So I can see you look, licking your lips there, brother. Okay, the word in season, okay? But, <laughs> you know, every nation has got amazing food, amazing spices. And Okay, let's get back to the word. <laughs> hmm. Okay, let's just put a call it off. We're going for breakfast. Let's <laughs> go, to go, go and have buffet this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank God. Okay, let me get back to the scripture. So, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Verse 5. For it is sanctified by the word of God. Okay? Oh, you said the prayer part. So you're reading ahead of myself. So when you pray, praise God. I thank you, Lord, for this meal I'm about to receive. Consecrated to my body. Thank you, Lord, according to your word. The truth says I can eat all things. As long as I pray. As long as I receive it with thanksgiving. Amen. And I do not abuse the freedom that I have to eat. <laughs> my wife showed me a picture the other day of a couple of years ago. And we were around. We were really in thanksgiving. And we were abusing what the Lord had given us. The freedom and the liberty. So we learned a lesson. You can still enjoy all of that. But <laughs> there needs to be self-control. One of the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. Yeah. Hallelujah. So let's go to Matthew 22. Are we covered with this now? So you do not feel condemned. So if you decide to go and eat with Christian friends who may be following Jewish ways, you got all the freedom to eat as you eat. Apostle Paul, he took it to another level. Because in those days, when they were eating meat, the meat was given to idols, sacrifice. So he said, if somebody's got a weak conscience, he will not eat meat. I am not Apostle Paul, my brothers and my sisters. If you see me with a Texan steak, 1.2 kilogram, listen, if you've got a weak conscience, take it up with the Lord. Because me and the Lord, we are thankful for this burnt offering. Okay? There's certain things I will sacrifice when the time to fast is to fast. And that's when I talk about food the most, okay? Because <laughs> suffering for the Lord. But the reality is this. We've been given such freedom. And we must not abuse the freedom. Look at it like this. Parents make rules not to limit you, but to create an environment for you to have fun. That's it, okay? So let's go to Matthew 20, 22, verse 37 to 40. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. Verse 39 says, this is the first and great command. 39. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So let me stop right there. In the Ten Commandments, you'll notice that the first five is between us and God. And the last five is between us and our neighbor. So if I love God, I will not commit adultery. So that means I will not fornicate. I will not mess up my relationship with my wife. So right there, I've already fulfilled that law, not meaning I'm trying to obey the law. I love my God, and it displeases him if I do certain things. And the Holy Spirit says, no, don't do that. Okay, because sometimes our conscience can be twisted. We can be perverted. It feels good. It looks good, so I'm going to just do it. But then there's a little voice that says, not beneficial. See, out of all the sins that we can do, the only sin that truly damages our um, sensitivity and our innocence is sexual sin. It's the only sin that damages you inwardly. Everything else, it's not affecting you with who you were created to be. Okay? So I'm just teaching you that because that's what the Bible says. So if I love my God, I will not covet my brother's wife. Okay? I just use it for illustration purposes. We don't got to meet outside. I'm just illustration purposes. Because I know Cedric's going to handle me. If I'm just, I'm not going to covet his wife. You understand? So if I love Cedric and I love my face, I will not covet his uh, wife. You understand? We got an understanding. The fear of the Lord is in me and I got the fear and respect of my brother. Okay? So why would I want to covet something that, that, that would displease my brother? Think about it like that. Okay? So by doing that, you've already fulfilled the law. Because I love God with all of my heart, with all of my mind. And then he says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
So I would not like for any of you men to try and hit on my wife. Because I will hit on you, if you know what I mean. <laughs> furiously. And laying hands furiously, because that's what the Bible says. Lay hands. And the fervent punches of the righteous shall prevaileth much. Now, am I taking out of context now? Okay. <laughs> Verse 40. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. So what, by you just doing that, you have already fulfilled the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. That's it. Walking in love. That's it. I will not want to steal from somebody because I don't want to be stolen from. See, when you go read the book of Leviticus, Leviticus is not saying tooth for tooth and eye for eye. God is teaching us compassion. If you steal something from somebody, God wants you to experience the same pain. That's why a tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye. So that you have compassion if you did somebody wrong. So if you steal from somebody, that's why you need to pay them plus four times. So that you can feel the pinch of what you just did. So that you will have compassion not to do it again. It's not to say now, okay, the Bible says now tooth for tooth. My brother, you punched out my tooth. I'm going to punch out two of your tooth. You know, your tooths or your one tooth that's left behind. I don't know. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It's teaching us to have compassion that you feel the pain. You know, and that's why he speaks about if your bull goes and kills another bull, then you have to kill that bull or you pay the guy and then you can slug it and you have meat. That's what he spoke about. So there's reasons for all of these things. So when your bull is causing problems in, with other people's bulls, that bull needs to be put down. So that it doesn't cause hurt. So that the one who has his prized bull will experience the same pain as if your bull was killed by that bull. That's what he's doing. He's teaching us compassion. That, okay? Is that making sense? It's not a whole bunch of do's and don'ts that, that you're going to go to hell. It's that we can be compassionate. That's why when I know people that struggle with addiction, people that are living on the streets, I have compassion because I was there. I went through all of that. So I know the pain that you go through. And then I teach you how to get out of it. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 14. Verse 14, uh, 13 says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. So there's freedom and liberty. That's what we've been called to, each and every one of us. Okay? Some people think becoming a Christian is imprisonment. That it is limiting, but it is so liberating. Because when I lived in the world, I thought I was free. I did everything I wanted to do. But everything that I did, I felt like a dog and dirty afterwards. Sometimes the things I did, I regretted. No, I'm not talking to you guys. You guys don't regret anything. You guys are so, I am so free. <laughs> no, but the reality was I was free to do whatever I wanted. But unfortunately, there were consequences because of what I was doing. Amen? Like yesterday, I was sharing with some people the things we used to get up in my BC days. And, and there were things that we did where that was not right. Okay? And I regret it today, but I'm grateful that I'm free from that. You know? So, freedom to do whatever you want to do does not mean it's really freedom because you will feel dirty. You will feel bad. You will feel guilty. You know? If you throw yourself to every guy or every woman, you will find eventually you don't value yourself anymore. That's where the problem comes in, is you don't value yourself. So you don't, you don't believe that you deserve better. So it's like, okay, just that's what my mom taught me, to keep myself for the one that is special. And every girl became special to me. <laughs> that's the truth. She said, save yourself for somebody special. And they all were special to me. Because I didn't have an understanding of my value. I didn't have an understanding of who I was. I didn't realize that I was special enough to have somebody special. Until I got saved. Hallelujah. My wife ended up there. She's not just. So she didn't hear that. But it's recorded so everybody can see. Praise the Lord. Okay. Verse 14 says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word. So how many of you can actually memorize the Ten Commandments? Many of us don't know the Ten Commandments. You know why? Because you're not meant to memorize it. Because we need to walk in love. Because when you walk in love, you're already fulfilling law. Okay, love also tells when you go wrong. How many of you, uh, okay, uh, yeah, discipline your children? What is that? Love. Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, that's love. So correction is not trying to limit you and, and destroy your life. It's actually trying to love you out of your bad situation. And that's what God does with us. That's why sometimes 
we feel guilty and we feel unworthy because what we did made us feel unworthy. That's why Adam and Eve hid. They messed up and they hid. But the reality is God loves us. Amen? So, for all the law is fulfilled in one word and is spelled L-O-V-E, love. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hallelujah. Let's go to Joshua chapter 5. Now I want to teach you something about, is Jesus teaching us to break the law? Is Jesus teaching us to uh, sin? Because we're going to see through scripture, Joshua was the one who was the successor of Moses. Moses wrote the first five uh, books of the Bible. You do know that, the Torah. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And Joshua was his uh, apprentice. He was his protege. He was going to take the place of Moses. So when you read your Bible, you will find that Moses was on the mountain and Joshua was halfway up the mountain. So when Moses fasted, Joshua fasted. When uh, Moses was in the tent of meetings, worshiping the Lord, talking to God, God was writing, he was writing things down and the laws and how to deal with people. Joshua was there. When Moses left the tent of meetings, Joshua remained. So Joshua knew the law because he was sitting with the man who received the law directly from God. And he was being trained up to be the successor to lead the people into the promised land. So we see up until this point, the law had been written by Moses. And up until now, we see that the law was going to be guiding Israel. Because when you read Joshua chapter 1, what does it say there? Meditate on this word, the law, day and night so that you will prosper and you will have a good life. So Joshua wrote down that the Lord told him, be of courage, meditate on the word day and night. So Moses, uh, Joshua knew the word. He knew the law. He understood it like the back of his hand. But now... They are going into the promised land, which God promised Israel. But the original um, Israelites who came out of Egypt, they said there were giants in the land and the land was devouring all the inhabitants. Now listen to that. If the land is devouring the inhabitants, that means there's no inhabitants. Does that make sense or not? You do English, so you understand. So they said... The land devours the people. But I see giants in the land. So shouldn't the land have chowed up the giants and spat them out too? You like it? But because they had such a pauper mentality, slave mentality, that they believed that they could not go in there. And they said, we are grasshoppers in the eyes of these giants. You need to read your Bible. None of them went to the giant. Hey, giant, do you consider me a grasshopper? No. Okay, that's not Mr. Miyagi, grasshopper. Okay, wax on, wax off. That's not the type of uh, grasshopper, okay? But we're talking about they did not go to the giants. They were fearful of the giants. The two men carried a bunch of grapes. Go to pick and pay, go to these places, and you go look at the, the, the bunch of grapes. Some of them look like raisins. But here were two men that took one bunch that they put it on a staff and they carried grapes. Just think about that. God had already prepared king-sized beds. Because if there were giants, that means big houses, big beds. Think about it. Because a giant is, I know some tall people, their legs stick off the end of the bed. And that's like a normal bed. For me, that's fine. But to him, because he's so tall, his legs hang off. Now, all the guys that are tall suffer with that. I don't have that problem. So sorry for you guys. My feet are always covered. The sheets cover. The blankets cover. We covered. Tall people. <laughs> and all the short people said shame. <laughs> Praise the Lord. See, when we in one accord. <laughs> Not a Honda accord, but I'm just saying one accord. All right, let's continue. But I want to teach you something here. Is Jesus going to teach his people to sin? Because we need to read this. And we need to see something here. In Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 to 15 says, 13 says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho. So now they've emptied into the promised land. 
and there's certain things that they need to face, okay? So this is the Jericho account. Everybody knows the story about Jericho. One day you go around in silence, and the last day you go seven times. But I want to read something to you before we get there, because we're going to hear who is speaking, and you need to read your Bible carefully, okay? And it says this, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood. Now you notice that man's got a capital M. Okay, so this means it's not an ordinary man. Doesn't mean it's a big man because it's capital M. It's just saying a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. You notice his is capital H and it's in his hand. So it's capital speaking about a, spir a spiritual being, but we're going to see who the spiritual being is. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for, or for our adversary? Look at the, 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 the confidence that Joshua had. He sees this man, because this man is no ordinary man. He sees the man got a sword in his hand, and he pitches up and he says, are you for me or are you for my enemies? This is telling you that this man was with God, that no man, he had no fear for man. It's like, oh, you got your sword drawn. You probably just rocked up there like, what? <laughs> Maybe he comes from the south. I don't know. Like, what? What? <laughs> okay? But look here. Verse 14. So he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Okay, look here. This, this being is the commander of the army. All right. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. Now I want to share with you, how many times did you see men fall at the feet of angels? What was the first response an angel said? Don't worship me. But you need to read something here because look here, he fell down and he worshipped. Okay, and then he says, and he said to him, "What does my Lord say to his servant?" Because now he's worshiping. Okay, now what is the Lord going to say to him? Verse fifteen: The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, "Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy." Forty years and some change. There was a man standing in front of a burning bush that was not consumed. And there was a special being who spoke through the bush. They said, take off your sandals for where you stand is holy. He spoke to the Lord. Because then God spoke to Moses and said to Moses, uh, I want you to go and set my people free. And he said, who shall I say has sent me? I am that I am. It's the same person speaking now to Joshua. Because he did not say, get up, don't worship me. Every angel said, no, 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 fear not. I, I'm just a messenger. We, we, we're working together. But he's saying, I am the Lord of heaven's armies. This is Jesus speaking. Okay, look here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You just, all you have to do is switch off uh, Netflix for a bit and you'll see these things. It's amazing what happens when you see in the Bible. Like, oh. Because when you read the Bible more and more and more, angels say, no, 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 you don't worship me. Don't worship. Because there was an angel that wanted to be worshipped. And his name is Lucy Fur. <laughs> Lucy Fur. Okay? <laughs> if your name's Lucy, please forgive me. Okay? But he's, he's, he wanted to be worshipped and he got kicked out of heaven. He has no place. And the thing is, he is under your and my feet. That's where he belongs. Amen. Okay, so let's see. And it says, where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So he obeyed. So we notice that this is no ordinary being. Now we're going to need to go through the next 17 verses in Joshua chapter 6 to understand what Jesus is about or God is about to tell Joshua what to do. Keep in mind that they had the law. The Lord's, remember the Jews, when they came into the wilderness, God said to them, every day you go and get manna, but the day before the Sabbath, you get twice as much. Because on the Sabbath, you don't go and get manna. And we notice those who took manna, and if they took too much, it would spoil. You know, because you were thinking, hey, I'll eat, I'll have a midnight snack. It would spoil. So it was just enough to sustain you. But the day before the Sabbath, you make sure you collect double, because on the Sabbath, you don't work. So let me, I want you to read this now, because God is not going to teach you to sin. Yeah, I want you to get that in your mind. I, I know I'm hanging on this because I want you to see something. Because Jesus said, my father and I are still working on the Sabbath. You're all sitting looking at me like, oh. 
What is it? Don't worry, we'll get there now. I just need this to drop into your head. So when you got it in your head, you got to see something what God tells them to do. Okay, verse 1 says in Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. So they shut the doors because they saw the enemy coming. Verse 2, and the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hands, its kings and its mighty men of valor. Yeah, he's saying, I've given it to you. Now many of us, we sit and God says, start a business, start a ministry, do this, do that. And now you're looking and you see all these giants, you see these high walls. These high walls is your insecurity, inability, unqualified, lack of funds, lack of faith, lack of, and that's what we're looking at. And God is saying, I have given you that ministry. I have given you that business. I have given you that marriage. And all we see is Jericho. We are the ones that are the ones seeing the difficulties. We are the ones that are dumbing down what God says we can be and what we can do. Oh, but you know, past, uh, Father God, I don't have the money. God never said you had to have the money. Because who is the provider in the situation? No, but that, that's very hard for people to see that because every month you get a salary. And that is how you value yourself because that is what your provision is. And that's not your provision because God has more. You see, you value yourself according to what you receive monthly. When God is eternal, all the riches and all the gold and the silver belongs to the Lord. But there's greater riches than the silver and the gold. I liked what uh, uh, Brother Louis said last week. Are we, we buying gold to fix the potholes in heaven? Because in heaven, the streets are gold. Okay, you guys didn't get it. It was too deep, Louis. You, you obviously had the anointing. I didn't have it right now. But people laughed. Because think about it. We're not buying gold to fill the potholes. In heaven, because the streets are gold. The pillars are pearls. Ladies put the pearls around their neck. Those, those are gates. Those are pillars. A whole... Okay, let me not go there. Because then, yeah. Okay, let's get back to the word. Verse 3 says, You shall march around the city, all you men of war. Now, you also need to understand, Levites were never told to go to war. But we see in Chronicles, where... Uh, the prophet says, put the worship band up front. <laughs> you got a wall. Put the worship guys up front. Hmm? But look here. He says, all you men of war, you shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. Now look at it like this. God created everything in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. Okay. When they collected manna, they collected for six days. And on the seventh day, they rested. You need to read your Bible now because this is why people get bent out of shape. Look here. Verse 4. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Now let me just sit there. Those that like the end times. If you really want to understand the book of Revelation, take the book of Joshua and marry it. Because if you look, there's seven trumpets, seven seals, seven bowls. And here we see seven priests with seven trumpets. You see, Joshua speaks about a Messiah who's coming to war. And that's why the Jews are fixated not on a suffering Savior, because they were waiting for one who would take the throne of David. But he's still coming. That is why you and I, the church, who were called Gentiles who were called infidels according to the Jews who were unworthy. We were defiled and unclean people that they would not even sit with you. You need to understand that, that we were so defiled that Jews would not even eat with us. They wouldn't even consider being around people like us. But God gives us his Holy Spirit because he cleansed us. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm preaching good here today. But anyway, let's go. But the seventh day, you shall rest. What does it say there? Okay, and he says, you shall march around the city seven times. Meaning, they're going to do seven times more on the day they should have rested. And now God broke the law now. Israel broke the law. So they do not have victory because they've broken the law. Am I talking to somebody here or is this not interesting? Have I lost you? 
Because on the seventh day, they're doing seven times more. Hmm? Maybe I should have got all the stats, how long to, it took to walk, how far it went, and then you'll see seven times. Because we're so used to, oh, I climb in my car, the shop is on the corner. Grrr, you know, to you, it's no problem. I'll just climb in my car, I'll drive around Jericho. No, these people walked in the sun. Huh? And on the walls, you can only imagine the enemy laughing. Look at these popos. <laughs> yeah, it's a fruit, yeah, you see. Not for the, okay, but look here. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. That means some walls are going to come down. Okay, verse 5 says, It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout. See, that's why you need to know when to shout. Sometimes people are shouting at the wrong time. So in the middle of worship, which is the deepest moment, hallelujah, and you're like, hey, hold on, we're in worship now, brother. You missed your cue. <laughs> Praise you can, hallelujah. Because this is what happens when you're in worship. Everybody's seeking the Lord. And you go, hallelujah, and you're going to pull them all out of the Spirit. Now, I'm not uh, knocking uh, Pastor Mark because he, he's timely, okay? But I'm talking about when people miss the mark. When you, when you praise, you praise. But when it comes to worship, your worship comes to a place where you are totally surrendered. You cannot speak because now it's God speaking. And you're just in awe. Okay? So uh, no indictment on you, my brother. I know you can say hallelujah whenever you want to say because you said on cue. But I'm talking about those that miss it. And then, then, then you're wondering, they're screaming victory, but they don't have victory. Because this is what's going to happen. When you shout with a great shout, then all the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go up every man straight before him. Verse 6. Then Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark of the Lord. So what are they doing? They are saying the Lord goes before us. The Lord revealed himself saying, this is what I'm about to do. I'm giving you Jericho. And all I'm asking you to do is just to do a little bit of walk, walkies. You just did a little walk. Walk around the first day once. Second day once. Third up until the sixth day. But on the seventh day, when you hear the trumpet go, shout. So you see... People, when you talk about end time stuff, people see it as a bad thing, okay? Which is actually a good thing for us who are in Christ. Because he says, I've gone before you. He was crucified. Okay, no, no. We'll get there. Get there. Let's go to verse 7. And he said to the people, proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. So now they're putting the weapons in front. So the Lord went first. God always goes first. That's why he says in James, when you surrender to him, when you return to him, when you go back to him, because he made the first move. It's like this. Guys, you have to make the first move. She ain't coming to you until you make the first move. You can look and try and look all sexy. and Listen, you need to make the move. She is not going to move until you move. It's just making sense. Okay, but make it biblical moves. You know what I'm saying? Be scriptural. Hallelujah. Because if you are a man of the word, you need to attract the woman of the word. Because if, you, you, if you're using certain bait, you're going to attract certain... Okay, you understand what I'm saying? You fill in the blanks. Okay, just putting it out there. Hallelujah. Are we okay, yeah. I was just going too deep here. Yeah. Verse 8 says, So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people... That the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horn before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. What does the Bible say? My goodness and my mercy will go before you. My goodness and my mercy will follow you all the days. Right here you actually seeing how the Lord says I go before you and I will follow you. So God is in front and in the back. You understand? He gives you the instructions. Okay, this is good teaching. Yeah, verse 9 says, 
the armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Verse 10. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. Now, ladies, you went on the walk yesterday when you went hiking. I want to ask you a question. While you were hiking, were you talking? Obviously, I heard that. Did you hear that, my brother? You heard obviously. So, I, by your confession, this was very hard for the woman for seven days. Okay, ladies, I'm not picking on you today, guys. Ladies, please, you understand. I just used a simple example. You were going on the mountain. We were talking, obviously. Okay, so you proved my point. Okay, now listen, okay? <laughs> not picking on you, ladies. Come on, I still love you, okay? I, I'm allowed to do this, am I not? Even those that are watching by live stream, ladies, please, don't take offense, okay? But imagine. That's why it says in the book of Revelation, there'll be silence in heaven for 30 minutes. Just saying, just saying, just saying, just saying. And it's precise 30 minutes. 30. Okay. This is not going over well. I've, I've dug such a hole. <laughs> I'm so deep now, I can't get out. <laughs> but anyway, we see that these were women of God. <laughs> Verse 11. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. But did you notice they did not walk alone? I want you to see this because God was with them. Wherever God is sending you, you are not alone. He's already gone into your future. That's why I know, Pastor Chantal, the Lord has already gone into your future. And that's why those doors have opened because He's already in the future. And the Lord will walk with you, my sister, into those doors because it's His doors He made for you. Okay. Verse 12, and Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Verse 13, the seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the, law, the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them, and the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Did you notice it was in silence? They were not, because he said, do not make a noise with your voice. He did not say, don't make a noise with the trumpets. Because when there's a specific trumpet, then you scream and shout. See, the, you can read here, every day the trumpets were going. Because the trumpets was uh, alerting, God is moving now, it's time to catch up. That's why when you look at the rapture, we need to be ready. Because the time is coming. And when the fullness of the times of the Gentiles has come, then he's coming to fetch us. And that's going to be a sign to the Jews. We missed it, but praise God, now we have a second chance. Okay? So that they now receive what God has, so that they can go, the 144,000 can go into the four corners of the world and speak about God. Speak about Jesus Christ. That the Gentiles who were unclean, who did not deserve it, received the Holy Spirit. That's why you even see in Acts chapter 10, there was a man named Cornelius. He was a Italian, and he was a God-fearing man, but he was a Gentile. He was the first Gentile who spoke in other tongues because him and his household all received the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine? Your name is written to be the first Gentile to speak in tongues. Cornelius and his household for all eternity because they are the first yeah, okay, I'll get excited over these things. Okay, verse, verse 14 says, And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp, and they did six days. Verse 15, But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only they marched around the city seven times. So the day of rest should have been the day they should have done nothing. 
but they did seven times more. Now you're probably sitting here, why seven? Because seven is the number of completion. When you see in the book of Leviticus, when they did um, deliverance, they cleansed them several times. See, when you look, everything is in alignment with the seven days in creation. Everything is perfect by number seven. So here we see seven trumpets. So it's seven that is perfected. Look at when um, uh, Daniel and the guys were thrown into the fiery furnace. Did you notice they made the fire seven times hotter? That the soldiers that tried to throw the Israel, or Israeli boys into the fire, the soldiers died. Can you imagine a strong soldier who's holding you, is about to throw you into the fire and he dies and you're busy walking around in the fire, like just chilling. Hey? The Bible says, now you guys know, when we make fire, somewhere along the line, something gets hit, singed. You always smell hair at a bride, somewhere. Okay, there goes the hair on your knuckles, sometimes eyebrows, depending on how close you were. But you smell that. They didn't even have that smell. And it says they didn't even smell of smoke. You know at a bride, you will smell like smoke. It's an honor and a privilege. Us men, we appreciate we understand it. Our wives don't. They like the meat, but they don't like the smell. But we understand what it means to be a man of God. Smelling of smoke. Because you were being, preparing burnt offerings to the Lord. And you're feasting because you're receiving it with thanksgiving. And if the smoke is thick enough, you will be brought to tears. And those tears are joy. It's privilege, my brothers. Ladies will never understand it. They will not. You smell like smoke. You shower, you still smell like smoke. It's in your head. It's in, I was in the glory, in the glory, in the glory. Okay? <laughs> so, verse 16 says, And the seventh time it happened, when the priest blew the trumpets, that Joshua said to the people, Shout! For the Lord has given you the city. Verse 17. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. We just sang about Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. But we did not sing about Jehovah the destroyer. Because he brings destruction to the enemy. How powerful is that? Amen. Yeah. If you are with the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, uh, now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. It and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live. This is a woman that's a Gentile. She's a prostitute. Out of an entire city, only the prostitute and her family remained. And if you look, that woman Rahab is the very same Rahab that is written in the Bible through which David came through and Jesus came through. That is the Gentile bride, which I'm going to start next week. Because we're going to see the Gentile bride. I'm just giving you the highlights, which is the church. But look here, it says here, Only Rahab the harlot shall live. So look at this. There were people that knew the law of God. And they do not uh, receive what a sinner like that receives. Because through that, her name is written in the Bible. Still to this day. Remember when I was doing Pentecost and I was teaching you about the book of Ruth? Boaz, his mama, was Rahab. Boaz represents Jesus who marries the Gentile bride. Because Ruth was a Moabite. She was not a Jew. Naomi was a Jew. And through Naomi, the Jews, this is what we learn from Israel. Through us learning from the mistakes of Israel and learning what God taught them. Because by us reading this, Joshua chapter 6, a Jewish man, a Pharisee and a Sadducee will not be able to explain why on the seventh day they broke the law. That is why Jesus said, I and my father are still working. 
That is why Jesus said to the Pharisees, do you not untie a donkey? Do you not untie uh, your animals? Do you not go fetch an anim- your lamb if it falls in a pit? Because there was a woman that was bent over. And he said, this woman is a child of Abraham. Should she not be loosed on the Sabbath day? Then there was a man with a withered hand. And they were trying to trap Jesus. And he said, let the hand extend. And he said, this is the son of Abraham. Should he not be set free on the Sabbath? It's not the day to do miracles. It's not the day to heal. It's not the day to do works. But Jesus says, my father and I are still working. But the Jews became so legalistic. That they missed that the Sabbath day was the most holiest day where God does the most extraordinary, blessed things. Because that is exactly why we celebrate the Sabbath. Because on the seventh day, God began to look at his creation. And he began to look at all that he had created and it was good. Can you imagine Adam, because he was created on the sixth day. He Named all the animals that God had created. He had the capacity to already name every animal. God didn't say, what do you call this? He didn't tell Adam, give it a name. Adam saw every creature and he gave them a name. Adam. Because he who was created in the likeness and image of God. Let me finish this verse 17. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. It and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. I'm hopping on this because I don't know where you are today. But the good news is you can receive your deliverance. You can receive your salvation. She and all who are with her in the house. Because she hid the messengers that were sent. Did you know? This is end time prophecy. I want you to start thinking. Okay. The first time Moses sent 12 spies into the promised land. But then you go read, Joshua only sent two. They weren't spies, they were messengers. He sent two. In the end times, it says, after the church is raptured, there shall be two witnesses. Just think, if you read far enough, it's there. There shall be two witnesses, and everybody will see they will be killed. They will have the power to shut the heavens. They will have the power of the ten plagues. And then they will be killed. And after four days, they will be resurrected. And it says the world will celebrate because those two witnesses were killed. Now can you imagine how Rahab must have celebrated when the two men that she received and she hid them. She hid them from all the people in Jericho. And she was the one that put a scarlet robe. And then he put the witnesses in a basket. This was not Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. Okay? Get past those fantasies and and, uh, fairy tales. They let the two messages down to escape. So that through that escapism, because people call rapture uh, escapism, the church is afraid and they just escape. They escaped, and the ones that helped them to escape were the only ones saved. And you need to read your Bible. It says um, Rahab's house was on the wall. The rest of the wall came down, not her house. Come on. It was attached to the wall. If you understand structure and if you understand supports, that was part of the building, uh, the wall, and the wall came down, but her place stood. So I don't know where you are today, but I've got some good news for you. I'm going to ask quickly just to switch the lights off. Because I don't know where you are today. Maybe you were a harlot. Maybe you were messing around. Now, please, I'm not picking on women because men can also be harlots. Men can also prostitute themselves. Okay? So, this morning, you just heard the good news. That God is not legalistic. He's not breaking His law. By Him telling Israel, to do seven times more on the day that should have been rest. He was already revealing the one who is to come. We saw Joshua was speaking to their savior because that's what that man did, saved them by telling them 
All you need to do is walk around your storm. All you need to do is walk around your trial. All you need to do is walk around your mountain. And a time will come that you will give a cry and you will have your victory. So today, maybe you've put up walls. Maybe you are struggling with certain addictions. Maybe you are struggling financially. Maybe you are struggling with a sickness or a disease. Maybe you are struggling with a curse that came on you through your bloodline. But I've got good news for you today, my brother and my sister. Even those that are watching by live stream. The good news is that out of an entire city, there was only one woman who was known as a harlot, that was known as a sinner. So if you are here today and you have been called a sinner, you've been called all kinds of names, all kinds of wicked things, but I've got good news for you today, my brother and my sister. That the Savior went before and the Savior will walk behind us. All of His goodness and His mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. That God is about to change your story. God is about to change your identity. God is about to make you become like Pastor Charlene was speaking about. So there may be some things in your life that are falling off and it's bringing pain. Maybe there's certain people that are leaving your life and it's painful. And there's things that you are holding on to, but it's falling away. Because God is about to make you become all that He created you to be. Some people and some things cannot go with you to where God is taking you. So today, Lord God, I thank you for your mercy and your grace. I thank you, Father God, that you are calling back the sons and the daughters. Those that have fallen into sin. Those that have walked away from you, Lord God. I thank you that you are restoring them today. They will no longer be known as the harlot, but they will be known as the one that was part of the promise. So, Father, we thank you that in this place today, that you seeing the hearts of your sons and your daughters, you seeing what they are going through, you are seeing the challenges they are facing, facing within themselves the battle that they have so many insecurities that society deems what a man and a woman should look like, how they should behave. And they are facing all of these attacks from family, from friends, from society. So Father, today, help them to stand. Help them, Lord God, to break out and to break free so that they will be the only house that continues to stand when all destruction may come upon those around, so that we, Lord God, even in times of famine, will thrive and prosper. When things get difficult, that we will be able to raise our heads and raise our hands in freedom and liberty and say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free from drug addiction. Thank you for setting me free from pornography and sexual immorality. immorality. Thank you, Father God, for setting me free Thank you for delivering me from all forms of wickedness. Thank you for changing my way of thinking. Thank you for allowing me to see myself as you see me. That I'm not worthless. I'm not a mistake. That I am your son and I am your daughter. I am anointed of you and I'm appointed. That you have a special plan for my life. To go and help and set others free. So Father in the mighty name of Jesus. As Israel walked around those walls of Jericho. Today Lord God. We are prophetically walking around those stumbling blocks. Walking around those mountains. Walking around those giants. And we will see those giants come down. Those walls come down. Those mountains come down. Father, even the walls of trauma come down. Depression come down in the mighty name of Jesus. All sickness comes down. Uh, poverty come down. Because you, O Lord, are going ahead of us and you are following us. Your goodness and your mercy goes ahead of us. And your goodness and your mercy follows us all the days of our lives. 
Father, we are not going to be a people that's afraid to step into our calling. We're not going to be a people that's afraid to do what you've called us to do. As a ministry sent ones, you are raising us up in these times to teach the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We will not sugarcoat this message because the truth will set the people free. And Father, we will not be condemned because of legalism. We will not be condemned because of religiosity. We will not be condemned by the philosophy of society and man, but we are liberated because of your word and your spirit. Father, I thank you. You are giving us a new revelation and a new understanding of the law and living in the spirit, giving us a new understanding of walking in the word and fulfilling the grace that you have established on each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord God, that you are anointing us for such a time as this. Thank you, Father God, for setting the new wine for now. Not the last, but for now. The best wine you are releasing now. Father, I thank you as your spirit continues to be poured out upon each and every one of us. I thank you, Lord God, your sons and daughters right now. I'm seeing those ropes, those bondages being burnt up and being broken right now by the sword of the spirit. I'm seeing those webs of witchcraft being cut off by the sword of the spirit. I'm seeing those ungodly soul ties being cut off by the sword of the spirit. Every attachment to this world that is hindering your walk with the Lord, that's hindering your progress, that's hindering your um, success. The Lord is now revealing and telling you what you need to do. And he's revealing how he is fighting for you. Jesus Christ, you are our Lord and you are our Savior. You save us from all the lies and deception of the enemy. You set us free from all the wickedness of this world. You set us free from the kingdom of darkness. And you have liberated us, brought us into freedom in Christ Jesus. We are no longer just citizens of this world, but we are citizens of the kingdom of light. We are your citizens. We are your children. We are your people. We, the church, we are your bride. Father, I pray right now that we have an eager expectation as we are waiting for the bridegroom to return. We are waiting, Lord God, for you in Jesus' mighty name. If you can pray in the Spirit, begin to pray in the Spirit. Pray like your life depends on it. Pray like your family depends on it. Pray like your company depends on it. Because we see that there are walls and those walls must come down. So those that are watching by live stream, begin to pray and pray and push through because those walls are coming down. I'm seeing those that are bound and become proselytes who have missed the gospel of Jesus Christ, who have gone into the old ways, who have gone into the ways of practicing what the Jews did. And we are grateful. Father, we pray right now for Israel. We pray for those that are blinded. And we thank you, Lord God, that through your people, we who were the lost and the underestimated, the people that were um, discarded by society, when we were the black sheep in our families, you saw greatness on the inside of us. You saw David on the inside of us. You saw Gideon on the inside of us. When we said we were not worthy, you saw a mighty man and a mighty woman of valor. You saw a giant slayer. You saw a demon casting out vessel. You saw men and women of the power of the kingdom of light, men and women of character, men and women of divine reputation, men and women that will not compromise, men and women that will walk in your ways, but not by works because you have delivered us. For our faith is in you, Jesus. Our faith is in the finished work of the cross. Our faith is in you, Lord God, that you went before us. And we know now, Lord God, that we are your people, that we are your bride. And Father, we wait for you in eager expectation. I thank you, Lord God, as we look at the ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish. Lord, let us be the five wise. Let us have 
oil for our lamps. Let us have the anointing. Let us have the relationship with the Holy Spirit that keeps us watchful and that we are observant as we are praying, waiting upon the return of our Lord, waiting for Him to come and take us. As it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that He will meet us in the air and that those who died in Christ, that they will be... Um, given a glorified body and those who are alive in Christ will be transformed to, into the very likeness and image of Jesus and we will be able to understand the dimensions and the functionality of who he is all that he can do that we now can understand him because we have become what you have created us to be so father I know that the battle is against the flesh I understand, Lord God, that we are wrestling against our flesh. We are wrestling against the cravings of the flesh. But we know now that we have the Holy Spirit that empowers us. And I thank you, Lord God, that this flesh we crucify. We crucify the flesh. And then for we step into the righteousness of Christ Jesus in the Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you flood each and every one of your children yet today. Those that say that you, they belong to Jesus, Holy Spirit, begin to reveal yourself to them. Begin to reveal Jesus to them. Begin to open the scriptures to them. Let them no longer glance over scriptures that are challenging. Let them no longer hide the full counsel of God. But let them begin to see what the Word of God says so that they can be all that the Word of God says we can be that we can have what the bible and the word of god says we can have so we thank you lord god that it's by your spirit that you are leading us it's by your spirit you are empowering us it's by your spirit that you are raising the standard and i thank you father god that you are doing this with your people it is my honor and my greatest privilege to see you O oh lord raising up true men and women of God, raising us up, Father God, filled with your purposes and filled with the Spirit and using and utilizing the power that is in the blood of Christ and walking in the delegated authority so we may trample on serpents and scorpions. Father, we thank you. We take our rightful place in your kingdom. And Lord Jesus, take your rightful place in our hearts and in our lives any area that we have not given over to you today, we are handing it over, Lord God. We are giving over our marriages to you. We're giving our families to you. We're giving our finances and our businesses to you. Our property belongs to you, Lord God. We will not withhold anything from you, Lord God. We know your word is clear. If you love me, you will obey my commands. So, Father, you have given us two laws that we must love you with all of our heart and with all of our mind and with all of our strength. And you have given us another law to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So, Father, let your love, your agape love, flood us and fill us so that we are able to love you and to love others, Lord God, so that those seeing your love through us that they will return to you they will not be looking for false love counterfeit love but they will know what true love is because you are god of love so we thank you father god right now that you are doing this work in us and through us thank you father god that you are showing up and you revealing yourself from the book of genesis to the book of revelation and we thank you father god that we are truly standing on your truth that we are no longer bound by legalism but we are bound to you lord god we are knitted to your spirit we are chained to you lord god we are yours and we are grateful that you are ours we are co-heirs co-laborers co-joined everything that belongs to jesus is now ours therefore lord god all that is us and all that is ours belongs to you. This we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. And all those agreed said, Amen, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Give him a praise. It's time to celebrate him because God is good. Amen. God is good. Wow, that was awesome. You know you can do this also at home, eh? Just letting you know. Just in case you weren't aware of this, you know you can speak to God. You can spend time with God at home so i just want to touch quickly on bringing offerings now i know this sometimes is a difficult part because of economy and because of things becoming more expensive things becoming more difficult but 
I just want to share something here with you in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at 2 Kings chapter 4 from verse 1 to 7. Hallelujah. So, we're going to see there's a prophet called uh, Elisha. And we're going to see what's happening here. Verse 1 says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha. So, this was a servant that was serving the prophet, the man of God, the pastor, the evangelist, the teacher. Okay? And they were in a situation. It says, cried out to Elisha saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. So here is a man who fears the Lord, but he's kind of left his family in a bit of a situation here. Okay? So here was a man who feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So this man died and he left the family in debt. Now, we get taught in the book of Proverbs, which says, a righteous man, a prudent man, he prepares an inheritance for his children's children. And here is a man who fears God, but unfortunately has left people in debt rather than blessed. So verse 2 says, So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? So now look here. This prophet has got a situation because the person that was serving him and serving the Lord's uh, plan was financially unable to pay his debts. So you go to your pastor and you tell your pastor, I got financial problems. I'm sure you've been there. You remember that? Okay. But the good news is what we do is exactly what the Bible tells us to do. And it goes like this. Tell me, what do you have in your house? So this is what happens. What do you have? Because there's something that you have that God can use to be a blessing. God will take whatever which seems insignificant and turn that insignificant amount or something for you to be provided for. But let me not jump ahead of this. So he says, what shall I do for you? Tell me what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. So that's all she had. A jar of oil. She did not have anything else. Okay. Verse 3 says, Then he said, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. Verse 4. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Now, I want to just share something here quickly with you. This woman is in debt. And that means her children are in debt. Did that make sense? You know, like, look at the world. The nations are in debt. That means the people of any nation, that debt belongs to us. Even though you may be debt-free, you and I are still in debt. You can have millions and billions in your account, but you're still in debt. Okay? Because what the nation has put itself in. That's around the world. Okay? But let's see here. So, here is a wife and two kids that are in debt because of a man who feared God. That's not mean he was a wicked man, but there was a certain area of his life that was something that was not in alignment. But we'll get there. Verse 5 says, So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons. Does that not like sound like what Jesus teaches us to do? To pray? He says, go into the secret place, close the door behind you. The prophet says the same thing. You and your two sons go into your house and close the door. Make sure you got enough vessels. Okay? And he says this. Who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Verse 6. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Okay, now I want you to hear something. They were in such debt that the creditor was going to take the two sons and put them into slavery until they pay back the debt of the father. Okay? Verse 7 says, Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. 
So here we see God gives the man of God instruction. Go into your house, shut the door, make sure you have enough vessels. As soon as they ran out of vessels, the oil stopped running. But you see, this is a prophet and the prophet understands anointing. Each and every one of you here are anointed. Each and every one of you have been given an anointing of God. But you now need to use that anointing to increase and to multiply what God has blessed you in. Whether it's a business idea, whether it's a creative idea, whether it is um, whatever. Because God has given you an anointing and that anointing will multiply. See, we started off already earlier saying you are limiting yourself to your income. You think that is your value. When God has given you something that is more precious than silver and gold, he's given you an anointing. And that anointing, when you know how to tap into it, he will multiply. That you will pay off your debts and you will have enough to live off. And that anointing, when you know how to take care of it and when you know how to obey the Lord and you do what the Lord asks of you, you'll see that anointing will continue to increase in your life and you'll continue to grow and you'll continue to prosper to the point that the debt that others have left you in, you are now prospering and you can live off. And then you will not only stop there, you will step up and create another generation who will know how to walk in the anointing so that the generations afterwards shall have an inheritance. So that you and I, we think generationally. My wife and I, we've already been thinking like that. We're still waiting when the Lord's going to bring our children. We've already got accounts put with savings for their schooling. We're already doing that. We've already got children's clothing. We've already put all that stuff in because we're thinking ahead. Because when they come, I don't want to be running around. I need to get this. I need to get that. When they arrive, it's like, bam. Hey, hallelujah. Praise God. Because it's already happening. So that when they have children, they will do exactly the same thing. They're not going to be running around trying to scratch money and trying to do all these things because they have an anointing. So today, if you desire to sow a seed and if you trust in God for breakthrough, if you really believe God's word is good and that God wants you to be blessed, just raise your hand for an envelope. We've got two baskets in front. But when you look, the woman asked the man of God, what shall we do? I have practiced this principle myself. And this is the one thing that I've seen that changes your finances is when you trust God, when you trust him with your finances, when you trust him with your business, when you trust him, that is where God now takes what you have. And the anointing he put in you will increase. Amen. So let me pray for you and let you go. Well, let you come and so. Father, we just thank you right now that you have given us an anointing and a grace and the power to multiply. The dunamis power that speaks about multiplication. So Father, over this house, those that are watching by live stream, I release the dunamis power of God's promises and his word and by his spirit. The dunamis power, not only for miracles, not only for healing, but for increase, for multiplication. So, Father, in this house, I thank you. Whatever your children touch is blessed. Whatever they touch multiplies. Whatever they give to you, Lord God, and to your ministry, Lord God, will be multiplied so that the vision that you have for sent ones will continue to affect locally and go globally. We thank you, Father God, that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing and we alone give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. So you can come up and sew. Yes, I know. And uh, Pastor Chantal has got the card machine. And as you sew, if you and your family are going through a financial thing, just take an envelope and pray over it. And the Lord will do something in your house. Amen. So be blessed. Praise God. Praise God. I know you're all missing Pastor Rosie and Nelson. They will be back next week. Um, for those of you who are asking about Liesl and Monet, they are still here. They are serving in Benoni just for the last two weeks, helping Pastor Rosie and Pastor Nelson. So they are doing very well, but they will all be back next week. Um, tonight we've got our 5 p.m. service. If you want more, I know you'll be here. Amen. We, we love our uh, Sunday evenings. Wednesday is discipleship. Friday is prayer. And then I'm going to ask for David. We can say goodbye to the live stream, guys. Come to church. It's wonderful. And enjoy your day. We'll see you soon.